Have you really repented? It is a very relevant question for all of us Christ followers. There was a case when the basketball coach was astounded a player from his team had stolen the ball, but in his excitement he was headed toward the wrong basket. <laughs> You're going the wrong direction, the coach shouted. Stop! Turn around! Go the other way! But to no avail. The player didn't listen. He scored a goal for the wrong team. Just as this player was told to stop and turn around, God has told humans to stop and turn around spiritually in the Bible doctrine of repentance. But few understand what real repentance is. What a pity. Those who do not understand are doomed to continue in the wrong direction spiritually and to ignore God's plain commands that we should repent. Those plain commands are given to us in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Such ignorance need not plague those willing to learn, however. Before we proceed, let us read these uh, scriptures that I've just mentioned. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Then we go now to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It is Peter calling upon those gathered at Jerusalem to repent. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then please turn uh, to Acts chapter 3, and let's read verse 19, which says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Such ignorance, again, as I said, need not plague those willing to learn. However, we have just read the uh, admonition from Jesus Christ and from his apostles to repent or turn and go the other, go the other way. Now, the basic doctrine in the Bible to repent, actually, is... What does it mean? Well, it means to change from living our way to living God's way. Repentance comes when we see our sins, when we are deeply remorseful of them, and we stop sinning, resolve to obey God, and with His help actually do obey Him. But the usual teachings of this world, of course, are, <laughs> as you can guess, you as always, or as in most cases, totally diametrically opposite from what the Bible speech, uh, from what the Bible teaches us. Most people hold impressions about this subject that are far afield from the simple Bible truth. Some see no need for repentance because they feel they have not sinned. Others do not repent because they think all one must do is believe or accept the truth academically. Others confuse real repentance with temporary sorrow, remorse or simple emotion unaccompanied by any permanent change. Clearly such false beliefs cannot fulfill God's command. Now, what is the Bible teaching? Well, the English word repent is, of course, merely a translation from the original biblical language of Greek and Hebrew. The word, or the words, rather, from which repent is translated in both the Old and the New Testament, uh, that word means to turn, to change direction. Such a change in direction requires one to first see that he is going the wrong direction, stop going the wrong way, and finally to resolve to go God's way and obey God with God's help. But a person cannot even see that he or she is going the wrong direction until God opens the person's mind to see it. Now this truth, that one cannot truly repent until God grants repentance, so strongly flies in the face of the teachings of this world that many simply cannot accept it. Nonetheless, the Bible clearly states that it is not our own will, but the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. The Bible further states that repentance is something God must grant as he did when he granted to the Gentiles repentance to eternal life, as it's written in Acts chapter 11 verse 18. And also we are going now to see Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25. 2 Timothy 2.25 says, In humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, 
so that they may know the truth. God offers to grant one repentance when he calls a person to his truth, and we cannot be called to the truth unless God, by his and not our own initiative, decides to call us. And this is clearly said in John chapter 6 and verse 44, which clearly says the following. These are the words of Jesus Christ. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. If you're listening to this, if you're understanding it and being convinced by it, then God is calling you and leading you to repentance if you will follow his lead. When God calls a person and begins to lead that person to repentance, he does so by showing the person that he or she has been living wrong, that is by showing the person his or her sins. And since sin is the transgression of the law, as defined in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, God shows the sins by opening one's mind to understand God's law, which defines his way of truth. Now one who really understands God's law sees that he has not been living in accord with it, that he has been sinning and needs to repent or to change. The Hebrew word teshuva exactly means to turn around and go the other way. Brethren, friends, we all need to repent. Because Paul says very clearly in Romans 5 verse 12, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned without any exception. John declares plainly that in 1 John chapter 1 verse 8, that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now the presence of sin in us demands repentance, for God does not promise to forgive our sins unless we repent and are baptized and the wages or the result of unforgiven sin is death, as it's clearly stated in Romans chapter 6. And verse 23. We are going to see now also Luke chapter 3 verse 9. Because clearly repentance is not a matter to be taken lightly at all. But before that Romans 6 verse 23. Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words please notice the wages of sin is not eternal life in hell. That's another of the anti-biblical teachings. The wages of sin is death. Death for all eternity. But you see, because of the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. And now we are also going to see Luke chapter 3 and verse 9. Luke chapter 3 verse 9 states the following. And now, even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, as I've just stated a minute ago, repentance is not something to be taken lightly. Because the result, the wage of unforgiven sin is death. And, uh, you know, we see in Luke chapter 3 verse 9, Exactly the same threat for those who sin and don't want to have repentance and want to just continue living in sin. Nonetheless, many do not see the need to repent because, like the self-righteous Pharisees, they do not see their sins. Self-righteous Pharisees, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Verse 16 and 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So when one truly sees his sins in sharp focus, he will be deeply broken up about them. Hence, repentance is accompanied by serious emotion and sorrow. 
King David was deeply remorseful at his sin with Bathsheba, and his state of mind is reflected in his psalm and prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. Other example like that of Job in chapter 42 could be also cited, and let's go to Job chapter 42 and verses 5 and 6. Now we read the uh, words of repentance, the words of repentance that Job uttered. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes, my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Yet it must be stressed that although emotion usually accompanies repentance, bare emotion or sorrow unaccompanied by true change, brethren, is not repentance. Paul addressed this issue squarely in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where he shows the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now re I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So we have just read, the scriptures where we can see the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. You see, Paul explains that worldly sorrow produces death because it is only the temporary sorrow of being caught, a type of self-pity, of fear, of punishment or embarrassment. But the sorrow of God, he says, produces repentance to salvation because it causes a permanent change in behavior and leads to a person's becoming totally clear from the reoccurrence of sin. In fact, the change, in beha the change of behavior that accompanies repentance is the best proof of one's repentance. John the Baptist refused to baptize those who had not shown by their changed behavior that they had brought forth the true fruits of repentance. And he addresses them, those who did not truly repent, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7 and verse 8, where we read the following. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of, to Abraham from those stones. And that's not the only admonition that God can ra raise children out of stones, and that somebody's ethnic origin, like the Pharisees, because they were direct, direct descendants of Abraham, that somebody's ethnic origin means his passage is secured, and uh, that his origin guarantees to him or her the entrance into the kingdom of God. No, not at all. You see, Christ dogmatically stated that mere lip service, misnamed belief by some, is not sufficient for salvation. Because in Matthew 7.21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Repentance, brethren, is not merely emotional sorrow, and neither is it penance. Penance is an act or acts designed to try to pay the penalty of sin to oneself, such as by doing some good works or charity, or good works of charity. All the good works are necessary in a Christian's life. They do not forgive past sins or pay their penalty, for our sins are forgiven by grace and not works. The Bible simply does not teach the doctrine of penance, 
and penance is in no way even similar to repentance which God's word teaches and indeed commands. Salvation requires obedience and it therefore requires one to stop his old ways and begin obeying God. It requires repentance. Such repentance is toward God the Father who is the author of his law and against whom our sins are directed as King, uh, King David clearly said in his Psalm 51, in his repentance psalm. But we also read this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Testify to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when we repent, we repent to God for committing uh, the lawlessness, breaking his law. Our faith is towards Jesus Christ in what way? Well, in a way that we accept his sacrifice for our sins. And as a result of our repentance toward God and accepting Jesus Christ's sacrifice in, in, in faith to pay the death penalty for our sins, as a result of that, uh, we are granted, we're given as a gift, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we go to baptism and when we have true biblical baptism in which we accept true Jesus Christ who didn't rise on Sunday but after three days and three nights being in the grave and uh, after we truly repent by showing, demonstrating changes that have been taking place in our lives. Such repentance goes far beyond a mere outward verbal expression of belief like so-called accepting Jesus in your heart and even far beyond a few mechanical changes in behavior. Brethren, it pierces deep into the heart and mind of the person and embodies an unconditional surrender from living one's own way to truly living God's way of life. It requires putting Christ above all else in one's life and hence, in a symbolic sense, sacrificing your own life. We read about this in Luke chapter 14 and in Romans chapter 12. So, True repentance requires putting Christ above all else in our lives. Luke 14. And here we are in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Of course, this is speaking symbolically. It doesn't mean we are hating anyone, but meaning we are hating any wrong ways that our fathers, mothers, brothers, whoever is leading, and we cannot obey them in following the same wrong ways. Verse 27, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish all who see it began to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. And then in Romans chapter 12, we are going to read about the need to be to be transformed, uh, transformed by the working of the Holy Spirit that is in us, that is in Romans the, uh, the, uh, chapter 12, and verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Further, true repentance is not a once and for all event, nor is it synonymous with perfection. No. The repentance requires and the one that we, well, the repentance is required before baptism. The repentance should be uh, all life, all throughout your life, we should have that repentant attitude, repentant spirit. But the repentance required before baptism is indeed a focus turned around from our own way to God's way. It's a massive spiritual reversal, if you wish. Yet, even at baptism, God does 
not reveal all of our sins to us at once, nor do we immediately overcome all our sins. So if you're waiting to be perfect or to be more perfect to be baptized, no, you know, you're making a grave mistake. There is no way. Baptism is for people who are uh, who have committed terrible sins, who have earned death penalty for because of their sins, for people who are sick and they, who will have a lifetime to grow and overcome all of their sins. Now we continue to see and battle those sins over time while we grow in God's grace and knowledge of His ways as we are admonished in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. As God reveals His law to us and hence our sins, as we see how we fall short of the law, we must daily repent. Brethren, we must see our sins, stop them, resolve to do right and follow through with God's help continually. Indeed, we must grow spiritually for the rest of our lives. But our obedience to God's law comes with help from Him. No one can obey God's law in its fullest spiritual sense, in heart and mind, without His help. We read that in the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. That was verse 24. And pre prior to that, we read verse 23. So, no one can obey God's laws in its fullest spiritual sense, in heart and mind, without his help, as we have just read in verse 23 of Jeremiah 10. This is because the minds of humans are susceptible to the pulls and deceptions of Satan, dear friends. Yes, that's the case. But yet, the Spirit of God, which is given to those who have been properly baptized after true repentance, is more powerful than Satan, and can and will give us the strength to obey. Now here are the key verses on this subject about true repentance. So here is a brief summary of the key scriptures about the subject. Mark 1 verse 14 and 15 and Acts chapter 2 verse 20, uh, verse 38 that is, we are commanded to repent, which means to change from our way to God's way. Romans 2 verse 4 and Acts chapter 11 verse uh, 18 Repentance must be granted by God, who calls according to His will. Romans 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 11. Sorrow that produces true repentance is far different than mere worldly sorrow. Matthew 7, verse 21. Salvation requires obedience to God. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. We cannot obey God without His help. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 and verse 18, spiritual growth is a process and does not happen all at once. And Psalm 51, repentance is often accompanied by deep emotion. In conclusion, brethren, the importance of repentance cannot be overemphasized. It is a first step towards salvation. Have you repented? If not, then the words shouted by the basketball coach to the confused player are for you. You're going the wrong direction. Stop. Turn around. Go the other way.